Um, well, that takes us on to David. Okay. Who um, I think was going to be talking about non-driven imaging. Yep. I shall fire it up. Right. Here we go. Um, I'm sure a few of you saw my article in the newsletter. I um, can't remember which issue it was. I think it was November or December about undriven imaging and a few little examples. I thought I'd do a little more uh, explanation of how it, how it works. Um, we've got some really great imagers in the society. Three of them here tonight, Ken, Bill, Alan. Here's one of, uh, oops, I'm clicking the wrong button. Here's one of Bill's images, uh, Ken's images, sorry, from the beginning of the year, which is M33 and quite an amazing image. And that's composed of 50 frames of uh, just over a minute each. Um, and it, take the images and stack them together as we've uh, seen from Alan Clitheroe's brilliant uh, tutorial that he gave back in January, 2018. Of course, if you go out with your camera and just open the lens, uh, open the shutter for a few seconds, what you get is star trails. Because they are spinning, the sky looks like it's going around in the other direction. And what you need to do to compensate for that, oh, well, if, actually you can do something nice with star trails if you point your camera to the north, you get these lovely effects. Um, but what you need is something like one of these driven mounts that you can pop your camera on or a small telescope. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, there was a huge flurry of people taking up new hobbies, including astronomy. And I think as June found her cost by ordering too late, you, we, there was no nothing coming into the country. Everything was bought out of every shop and online store. So is this possible. also not due to the fact that nobody's spending their money on anything else at what these things cost? Yeah, often. Not, not expensive in, in the bigger picture, but yeah. Um, so when I was trying to find one, I actually came across a, a YouTube channel of a guy who showed that it was possible to do astro imaging without any of this fancy kit. And what you need is basically a digital SLR choice of lenses. Um, I think some bridge cameras and smaller cameras that are able to adjust things like exposure times and ISO could be used as well. You need a, a good sturdy tripod because you want to be sitting there for quite a while and don't want anything moving. And another handy device, you can either use a manual um, remote control um, or one of these things here, which is called an intervalometer. It's a very simple little timer. You can set how many frames you want to take, how long you want each frame exposed for. And then you just press the, the go button and it shoots off as, as many frames as you need. And they only cost about 15 pounds, so not too difficult to come by. So once you've got your equipment, you need to make a few adjustments to your camera settings from your usual um, photographing landscapes and pets and things. You want to go to manual focus because you want to be able to focus right out to infinity. And you want to go into raw image mode because normally cameras are taking pictures in JPEG, compressing them down to JPEG mode, uh, JPEG format. But JPEGs, although they're much smaller, are uh, contain lots of processing artifacts that you don't want in your, your image when you're trying to combine them together. You want to switch off image stabilization, which is quite a common feature of a lot of DSLRs. And make sure you've got plenty of space in your memory card. I made that mistake one night by not clearing it um, before I started. Um, a JPEG image will take about four megabytes. A uh, raw image for the same thing will be about 24 megabytes. So you get far, far fewer images on your memory card. So plenty of space. Need to change the ISO, the ISO, to make it as sensitive as possible. ISO is a measure of how sensitive the imaging is. Um, it comes from the days of film cameras when we had uh, 35 mil or, or other formats. 
and it, the higher the ISO number, the more sensitive the film is, or the imaging sensor is. Unfortunately, as you increase the ISO, you get more noise as well. It used to be grain in the film. It was the size of the, the grains in the, the film. You could just turn your camera up to the highest ISO that it'll be able to give you and um, see what you get. But there's also, there's, um, I'll write this up and stick it on the website. A handy website that will, for every camera, they've done tested hundreds and hundreds of cameras and measured all sorts of parameters. And one thing that they measured is the noise versus ISO. And for my camera, which is a Sony A65, I can get up to about 3200 with a good quality. But if I go beyond that to 6400 or beyond, I'm going to start getting a lot more noise for the same amount of um, resulting imaging. So I'll use 3200 as my maximum. The other thing you want to adjust for is exposure time, because you, as I said, you want a sharp image, you want in as much light as possible, but if you leave the shutter open too long, then you're going to get star trails. So how do you get the exposure time? One way is just by experiment. If you start off with a, a longish exposure, maybe 10 seconds, you'll see that you're getting star trails. You go down to maybe five seconds, you get slightly shorter ones, and you could progressively go down until you get what looks like good sharp images. There's a handy thing called the 500 rule, which again comes from the days of film camera. It doesn't work perfectly for DSLRs, but it's close enough. And it basically you divide the number 500 by the focal length of your lens times the crop factor, which is dependent on the camera type. Some cameras are full frame, which would be a crop factor of one. Mine is about 1.5. Some Canons and Nikons are about 1.6. So if you take a 300 mil lens, 1.5 crop factor, that tells me that I can get a maximum of 1.1 seconds before I get star trails. If you want to get even more, what's the word, um, precise, then the Le Havre Astronomical Society have a, a web page with a calculator on it, which you can look up the number of pixels in your camera sensor. Um, mine's is about 6,000. The size of the pixel sight on the, on the chip, mine's are 3.9 microns. And again, for my 300 mil lens, which is a, a 5.6 aperture, and I'm wanting pinpoint stars, you can select to have slight trailing or a little trailing. And the other thing that they take into account is the declination of the object you're shooting, because obviously everything's moving around the sky, but things closer and closer to the pole move less, the rate of motion across the frame is less. In angular terms, it's the same, but in terms of the, the rate of motion across the frame, it's less. So that then tells me that I should be aiming for about 0.9 seconds for my imaging at a declination of 50 degrees. So once you get everything set up and you go out and get ready, the process is to adjust the focus. You need to find a bright star, get the camera live view and zoom in as, as much as you can and then adjust your focus ring. Some lenses actually go beyond infinity. I'm not sure what they're focusing on beyond infinity, but um, you may have to tweak back a little bit from the infinity point from the or the limit of the lens. Center on the target, adjust the zoom, frame it nicely, and then take a series of images. So start up the intervalometer, to fire off. I usually do about 50 frames at a time. And then once I've done 50, maybe 60 frames, have a look and see if how far the targets drifted across this across the frame. Because it will in that minute and a half, two minutes that it takes to do your 50, 60 images have drifted a little bit or quite a lot in some cases. And then you repeat. 
go round and round and round, maybe take three, four, five hundred, however many frames you want. And then we get, after we've done all the imaging, take some calibration frames as they're known. There's dark frames, bias frames and flat frames. And I think um, Alan Clitheroe's talk in, from January 2018, which is on the, on the YouTube channel, goes into details about what these frames are used for and how you, uh, how you get them. And um, these are then used in the stacking process to compensate for various effects within the camera. So here's a typical um, frame that you might get out your camera. Doesn't look like very much, just a few stars. I think, is that coming out? Yeah, it doesn't look too bad. Um, but if we tweak it in some image processing software, you can see there is something in the middle here, something interesting. But you can also see in the background, there's a lot of noise. And the image processing is what we want to do to stack all these frames and get rid of the noise. So the processing consists of stacking these hundreds, possibly even thousands of frames together using something like Deep Sky Stacker, Sequitor, or other software. And then once the stacking's complete, you can use additional processing like Photoshop, GIMP, PaintShop Pro, etc. And this is Deep Sky Stacker with the frame here, a list of files that it's using and various settings and options down on the left-hand side. Sequitor looks very similar. Again, image frame, details of what you're loading and things you can adjust to improve the, the stacking process. And this is some of my results. Um, this was a first go at M31. I think you can see M31 kind of in there, not highly clear. This I think is M110, M32, probably around there. And then another attempt a few nights later when the, the sky's cleared again, which again, we're getting a lot more detail in the galaxy. There's a lot more background noise here, but it is improving. I think the stacking and processing is the biggest challenge in these uh, things to try and improve the quality of the images. M45, Pleiades uh, has come out really well. Um, I'm gonna rerun this and see if I can pull out a little more of the nebulosity, which I can just barely see if I really crank up the, uh, the gain on it, as it were. Um, but I think I'll, I'll, I may in fact have another go at M45 as soon as I get a chance, as soon as I get a clear night. And M42, Orion Nebula, which I think has come out pretty well. Um, again, there's quite a lot of noise on the, on the edges here. You can see these sort of bands of noise which are creeping in and uh, annoying satellites going through the, the frame as well. But I think there's quite a lot of detail starting to come out. So I am slowly getting the hang of this. And I think as a, as a technique, it's something that anybody can try if they've got a, a DSLR and willing to spend very little more money for a, a tripod and intervalometer and things, then you can certainly get some decent results. And uh, from what I've seen online, it should be possible to get much better than I have achieved so far. Um, but hopefully I'll, uh, I'll get better as it goes on. So that, that's pretty much it. But uh, yeah, if you have any questions about it, I'll try and uh, answer them. That's great. Thanks, David. Um, I, I, I had a go at this. I think it's really fun to do. It's, it's, it's really interesting stuff. And I, I think yours has come on really well, much better than mine turned out, I would have to say. Um, any other questions for David? Can I ask one, please? Yeah, carry on. Yeah. Um, the, I was interested in the formula with the focal length times the crop factor at the yeah. moment. Is that the actual focal length or the, the sort of cheaty focal length that they give you for uh, cameras with tiny detectors? And they say it's 50 millimetres and it's actually about five millimetres because the detector's so tiny. 
Um, yeah, I think that's that's what the crop factor is. So the lens that I use is a 300 millimeter lens, but the crop factor of my camera is 1.5. So what you would effectively have is it pretends to be a 450 millimeter lens because it's got a smaller detector than the, it's not a full frame. So you get that 1.5 times, which means you get a, a shorter exposure. You don't, you can't, I think if it was 300 mils, then 500 over 300 would be a bit longer. I'd probably get like about 1.5 seconds or something. Yeah. Thank you. I think Tony's wanting to ask a question. Yeah, Tony, where are you? Yep. You're muted, Tony. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Can I ask? Um, um, the, um, you talked about uh, turning the image stabilization off. Uh, can I ask uh, why and what difference is uh, by doing this? Um, it's it's really like turning off your mind, off your autofocus. You don't want the camera to start doing anything. That it, if it thinks that the star is moving through the frame, it may try and engage image stabilization. So you want to switch off as many of these automa automated magic things as possible. Otherwise, they may interfere with the imaging. So you go for basic, it's just a, a lens, a shutter, and a, a, mm -hmm. a sensor is all you want in the optical path effectively. I see that's where I'm going wrong, I, I think, uh, with my futile attempt. I think I've just remembered something I was trying to remember what I was trying to remember. Um, the reason why these lenses focus past infinity is probably because of the way the autofocus works. I suspect, without knowing, that the, it, it compares the various areas of the image for contrast, but it has to hunt. So it has to go past the point, find out the contrast is getting worse, then come back again. And the infinity is just another point on the focusing scale as far as the mathematics are concerned. So I suspect that's why it probably focuses past uh, infinity. Thank you. Can I say something? Yeah, I'll end. Uh, I'm very impressed with the, um, the galaxy picture you got there with one second exposures. I mean, that's amazing, really. But when, when you're looking at stretching images like that, what you really need to get is as much dynamic range as possible in each individual picture. Yeah. Um, and I would just be wary of using very high ISO settings, not only because of the noise, you can deal with a proportion of the noise by taking all dark frames, which was you alluded to in your talk, but also because you compress the dynamic range at very high ISO settings. Um, most of the chips in these cameras have got a, a, an electronic well depth of between say 16 and 65,000 electrons, but the analog to data converter only is usually 12 bit or 14 bit. So yeah, it's only yeah. looking at 4,000 or 16,000 levels. So you, you can actually have a lot more detail uh, within the chip, but what's read out is a smaller proportion of that anyway, because it's only a 12-bit or a 14-bit readout. And if you then go to very high ISO settings, you're further compressing that. Um, and you start looking at the very, very bottom, the darkest part, of what's stored on the chip. And that's where most of the noise is. So you, by using very high ISO, um, will actually degrade the picture, even though you think you're gonna get more out of it. You have to remember the chip sensitivity doesn't change. You can't change the sensitivity of the chip. What you're changing is the part of the well depth that you're looking at when you change the ISO setting. Right. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. If cameras um, so had sixteen bit output, which is sixty five thousand electrons in the well, mm -hmm. you wouldn't need an ISO switch. 
yeah. because you, you get the full dynamic range. Yeah. Most yeah. of the cameras that you, you, you would be using, there's a sweet spot and it kind of depends on the well depth and the size of the pixels, but it's somewhere between about 800 ISO and about 6400 ISO. And it, as you say, it depends very much on your cameras. And that yeah. website was very good to see where you start to fall off the noise cliff where things get very bad at about 3200 for that particular camera. Um, yeah. My, it, it, it's not only for one second exposures, it could be for 10 minute exposures. So for oh. instance, my particular camera, I use ISO 1600 because there's no advantage in using more than that. You just get more noise. Yeah, I checked I my, my Canon and it was um, really after 1600, there was no point in going any higher. Um, Alan, I'll, can I ask Alan a question about the image processing software? So the A to D converter in the camera is only giving us 12 bits or 14 bits at the most. So is the image processing software just assuming it was originally 16 bit because we always talk, it always seems to talk about 16 bit files when you import your raw files into processing software. Or was... is... Sorry, Phil, Sorry. go on. Yeah, or is there something else going on uh, is there a pseudo conversion back up to 16 bit to make image processing software work correctly? There is, there is most definitely something else going on. If you think about planetary imaging to start with, what comes off the chip of the little planetary cameras is always 8 bit, 256 chips. Uh, but what you get out of uh, one of the stacking softwares, Registax or Auto Stack, it is 16 bit. And um, it's it's not converting the individual frames. What it's looking at is the number of frames which are at a certain light level and the number of frames which are a slightly higher not light level and interpolating between them to give you that 16 bit in, uh, information. Mm -hmm. And the same thing happens if you put in a 12 bit or a 14 bit raw off your Canon and Nikon or Sony or whatever you're using. Deep Sky Stacker will interpolate between the different light levels at the same pixel point. When it's aligned all the stars one on top of the other, you get variations in, in lightness in different areas. And it interpolates between you to get that 16 bit depth. Otherwise you would never be able to stretch the pictures. You, the pictures would be what they call posterized. So yeah. you get step levels like a contour map uh, at, at whatever the uh, bit resolution you're you're say you're you're dealing with, fourteen or twelve. Yeah, that, that might that might explain why the Deep Sky Stacker has different, um, shall we say, stacking parameters where they talk about average or median. So you need a if you only have a small number of frames, it tends to say you should use average. Once you yeah. get above a certain number, it can do kappa sigma. So that must be something to do with interpolation then. Yeah, what it what it is doing is having a look at uh, well sigma deviation, standard deviation, the variation of light at each point, each pixel within the frame, and the really good thing about the sigma clipping, as they call it, stacking modes, is it will, in any given frame, only accept them if they are within one or two standard deviations away from from the, the mean. So if you've got a satellite going through, you one of your satellite images, you've got a nice trail going through. If you use the Sigma clipping stacking, it on those particular points in that frame, not the whole frame, but just those particular point, it says, hang on a minute, that's way too bright and rejects it. So you end up with a picture with the satellite trails removed. But right. to make it work, you have to have enough subframes to stack that the sigma standard deviation can be yep. wide enough for it to to recognize that if you only got 10 frames it can't do it so it just says well we'll average it we'll take a median yeah yeah and the yeah, other that one, was, yeah, very that one was 500 frames so i think it should have um possibly i need to look at that reprocessing that one with that uh, oh. sigma yeah, you, you could do it. You've got enough frames and you would get rid of the satellite trail. The other thing is the real reason why you don't use JPEGs. Yes, it's compressed, but also they're always 8 bit. Oh, yeah. yeah. You could see that the satellite 
was uh, one of the tumbling variety yeah. or rotating. You could see it was it was chopped the trail. That may that's have, just that, gaps in just the a, um, exposure. Just a side point of interest. <laughs> that may have been the the imaging because I'm taking just very short exposures. So I, you know, there's like ah, exposures. <laughs> that might right, be and it's that's good. the gap between frames. That makes more sense because what what satellites yeah are spinning like that yeah. Um, I was wondering what um, kind of resources people use for uh, tutorials um, to, or basically how, how they learn how to use, for example, deep sky stacking, because I had a crack at it um, a couple Scully. of years ago and they went Scully. terribly wrong. What's up? Yep, um, deep sky stack has got a very good help file. If you, if you go the, through... The Deep Sky Stacker itself, it's built into the software. And if you click okay. on help, there is a lot of information about how to use Deep Sky Stacker in its own help file. Right. That's okay. Worth, and worth a look uh, if you, maybe you've already looked in, you're still baffled. So, well, yeah. So it's not like too low level. Is it quite, does it kind of take you through? Well, it takes you what, from, you go through the different parts. Well, it's, it's quite good. It's from for beginners up to, you know, somebody, you know, goes beyond what I understand, certainly. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think it's quite a good help file within Deep Sky Stacker. What it doesn't do is really tell you how to undo your own mistakes, unfortunately, because Ken and I have had discussions about this. Um, and it is a struggle sometimes to find out where you've gone wrong, I must say. But the default settings, which it recommends, are usually okay. Yeah, for right. Worth, uh, the, the, the lecture I did a couple of years back in January on uh, deep sky imaging, I do go through the basic settings and, and what varying some of the basic settings mean. So if you're prepared to be bored enough to sit through that, I don't well, know. Well, no, that, that was actually the one that kind of made me thought, oh yeah, it's made it look so easy. And then I ended up with just this big blaring image that was uh, quite much further away from what I was actually shooting for. Oh, shut up then. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think Alan's, uh, Alan's tutorial was very good. It, it, it yeah, kind of helped a lot with getting my images um, I think you just have to try it again and again, tweak the parameters as you go, try this, try that. Okay. Um, I think the biggest thing is is trying to do the processing after it's done the stacking. The thing that comes out of the stacking needs a quite a lot of tweaking in mm. something like Photoshop or PaintShop Pro to, to just fine tune the, the image. Could it can I just suggest a tip for Scully or yourself? Um, what you can do when when you have got the completed image with Deep Sky Stacker, it usually looks quite dark, mm. right? And it's if depending how you set it up, it'll either be it'll probably be saved as a TIFF. What you can do is reload that image, and then this brings up a contrast and brightness scale in the top, top right of Deep Sky Stacker and you can actually adjust those to see with your image. You can stretch it in Deep Sky Stacker but you, what I find is you have to reload the image. It won't give you those stretch functions when it's immediately output the image file. That's what I found and there is a way of looking at what you've just stacked to see if it's usable. There, there is also when you've got it's gone to the final stage of Deep Sky Stacker and produced the final picture which as you say is often very black down at the bottom, immediately below it, there's a little histogram thing, yeah. which uh, not many people use, but I've taken to using it. It is very good, which uh, allows you to move sliders for the black point, the white point, and the midpoint of the red, green, and blue. Um, it doesn't change any of the data in the fi final image, but it stretches it for you there and then. There's a little apply button. And usually there's something like a logarithmic curve in the histogram and and the peak in the histogram is always way over to the left because it's very dark but you can slide the red the green and the blue across such that it's at the start of that uh, logarithmic curve and then hit apply and magically box by box a stretched image will appear which you can then save as a separate image if you wish to do so so you can do, for instance, a logarithmic stretch or a, a cubic or a square root stretch, or there's, there's about six or seven options. And so you can try them and have a look at them. Um, 
and whichever one you like, you can then save as a separate image and it's done nothing to the auto save. Uh, it's a separate image that's already been stretched. So you can take that into the GIMP or, or, or Photoshop or what have you and look at that. And, and sometimes that produces really good results. Ah, cool, I'll have a look at that. Yeah, I, I try to um, start off just following tutorials with these online, but the, the first steps, I could see what was happening and I could try that with my um, non-driven stuff. But when we got to the masks, I, I got in the most awful guddle and I couldn't remember <laughs> which one was going up and whether I had the foreground or the background. And it, one of the problems is that trying to follow these online is I can't see clearly what somebody else is doing. I think you would actually have to sit down with somebody as a, as a beginner to, to get yourself moving with these. Um, it was, it was re I found it was GIMP I was using and it was really quite hard to follow it online. Masks are very complicated things oh. unless you use them regularly. And, and to be honest, you, you've seen my pictures. I never use masks. Oh, well, I'm delighted to hear that because I got in the most frightful mess, I can't tell you. Um, and what used to be there was starting to get worse, you know, and you think, oh, God. So um, I, I, that was just awful. But I, I just followed exactly what the tutorials told me in a sort of, you know, dogged fashion and um, got so far and then... <laughs> so I'll leave yeah. these out next time. That's grand. Thank you, Alan. Yeah. The other the other problem is that GIMP is an incredibly powerful program, but it has the worst user interface I have ever seen. It's, it's really it's not amazing. intuitive as a beginner. It really is not. But you know, there you go. Um, it was the only one I had, so I just used it. But, uh, there's oh there's another bit of software you can get a trial and try it before you buy. Um, it's been reviewed in Astronomy Now magazine. Uh, it's called Affinity Photo. It's similar power to GIMP and Photoshop, but it does have quite a lot of its own inbuilt tutorials. You don't have to buy it. You can simply go to the Affinity Photo website and you can get a 10 day trial. And you can use that 10 days to decide whether you want to buy it or not, or whether the tutorials have taught you enough on how to use it. Um, and it, ha it has been reviewed extensively in Astronomy Now magazine by Nick Jimenek. Um, he did a 10, a 10 series um, instruction on it, you know, 10 months of magazine instructions. So he was quite impressed with it. Um, but you certainly don't have to buy it. You can try it before you buy. And the good thing about it is it's quite cheap. If you do want to buy it, it's £48. Pounds. Um, and it's a one-off purchase, unlike yeah. things like Photoshop, which are now subscription. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I've um, it's Jim here. I've just downloaded GIMP, uh, not GIMP, but Affinity Serif. Uh, I've got about eight uh, eight days to go, and uh, it's quite complicated the way it works. But it seems to work intuitively, and I'm certainly going to buy it this weekend. It's absolutely superb. Well, that's well worth looking at. Actually, that'd be great. June, I'll send you the link to download it and go right to the bottom and uh, click on the free trial. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. Now, any other questions for David or comments just now?